worship God about his love. Amen. Amen. And I want to continue really with that theme this morning. And um, for me, God touched my heart many, many years ago with his love. And more recently, he, um, I suppose probably six months ago maybe, and he reminded me that um, I'd come to have a fresh revelation of who my Jesus is. And I want to try to express that to you this morning, that each one of us needs to know Jesus as my Jesus, and not just as Jesus. Amen? And that's really important, because when we get an understanding of who Jesus is, and that he's actually my Jesus, we see him in a completely different light. Amen? And we walk in a, a totally new way. Amen? So turn with me, if you will, to Psalm 23. Now, it's a well-known psalm, as we all know. But as I've looked at that this week, I've been actually amazed at how much there is in Psalm 23. And I'm going to try and bring that out this morning as I uh, bring the word to you, uh, what the Lord has laid upon my heart. And there are actually 12 um, assets to this psalm, believe it or not. It's quite a short psalm, it's only got six verses in it. But there are 12 key points to this psalm. And I'm going to bring some of them out this morning. I don't know whether I will get through the whole lot because it's quite, each one of them is a message in and of itself. So Father, this morning, as we come to you this morning, we open up our hearts, we come before you, and we, Lord, ask for the spirit of wisdom and revelation to be upon us. Lord, we lay aside everything that's been going off this week, all the, all the things that have perhaps come against us, we just bring them to your throne now, Lord. And we thank you that we can come with boldness and confidence right up to your throne of grace to receive fresh grace and mercy this morning. And Lord, we want to acknowledge your love for us. And that, Lord, that we love you today. Hallelujah. So, Lord, we just come before you now, Lord. And we ask, Lord, minister your word into my heart. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's just read this psalm together. The Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Hallelujah. Praise God and amen. Okay. <clears throat> The Lord is my shepherd. Amen? He is the good shepherd. He cares for you and I. He cares for the flock. He tends to the needs of the sheep. He calms the raging waters, the turmoil, the storms. He leads, he guides, he protects us. He accompanies us wherever we go. He steers us and ushers us. He loves us. He gave his life for you and me. He died so that we might have fullness of life. Is he tending to your needs this morning as the shepherd? Amen. Is he looking after you today? Is he caring for you? Amen. We also have to be prepared to let him care for us. Amen? Sometimes our flesh gets in the way and says, ouch, I don't want to know about that, thank you, Lord. Or am I the only one that sometimes God challenges my flesh and I have to battle between my flesh and the Spirit because the Spirit of God always wants to lead me in righteousness and in His ways, amen? 
but sometimes my flesh wants to do its own thing. Amen? Amen. But praise God, the Spirit always wins. Hallelujah. And are you part of his flock today? Or have you gone wandering off, doing your own thing, being independent? And has he got to come chasing after you to bring you back? Let's turn for a moment to <coughs> excuse me, John chapter 10. Another very interesting passage of scripture. And I'm going to read verses 1 to 16. Most assuredly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Has he come into the door of your life this morning? To him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Amen. With the Lord leading you this morning. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him. Amen. Are you following the shepherd this morning? For they know his voice. Do you know the shepherd's voice this morning? Are you listening to his voice? Are you being obedient to the shepherd's voice? Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him. Are you fleeing from the works of the enemy, from his tactics, from his voice? We need to be those that flee from the voice of the enemy. For they do not know the voice of the stranger. Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke to them. Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Have you found the green pastures this morning? The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Hallelujah. We have abundant life this morning. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. He gave his life for you and I, that we might have that abundant life this morning. Praise God. But a hireling... He who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. Again, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep and are known by my own. Do you know the shepherd this morning? As the Father knows me, even so, I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Amen. We are all from many, many different places. Many different nationalities, many different uh, ways and walks of life that we've had before we've come here. But God has made us one flock. Amen. We are one people because we have Christ living inside of us. Amen. It's a mighty miracle that we can actually be one family together. Isn't that awesome? Only God could do something like that. I mean, we, don't, we weren't brought up in the same way. We didn't go to the same school. You know, some of us hardly know one another. Yet, when we talk together, when we come together, we are as if one. Only God can do that. Only Jesus, my Jesus, 
is the only one that can possibly do that. When I sit down with any one of you, we're like one because we have the same spirit of Jesus living inside of us and we can communicate together because of that. That's awesome. That's a miracle. Only Jesus can do that. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. It's wonderful. Praise God. Hallelujah. Point two. I shall not want. He meets all my needs. And he meets all your needs. Every need is met by Jesus. Are you in want this morning? Do you have a need? Then my Jesus will fulfill that need in your life. He will meet whatever you need today. My Jesus will touch your life today. Amen? If you have a lack, if you have a need, if you have a want, my Jesus will fill that want. No man can fill that need. No man can meet that need, but my Jesus can meet it. Your Jesus that lives inside of you can meet that need today. Amen? Have you been giving out? Because the Bible tells us this is more blessed to give than it is to receive. And freely we have received and freely we are to give. And as we give, Jesus promises to give back, shaped together and running over into our bosom. Amen? So are you giving out this morning of what God has freely given to you? Because if you've given out, then God promises to open the doorways of heaven and pour out such a blessing that you aren't able to contain it. Wow. Amen? But we have to be those that are giving out, giving out freely of what God gives us, whether that's spiritual or whether that's in a practical way. Amen? We have to be those that don't hold on to things. Unlike the world that holds on to everything and grabs all that they can get. We are the opposite to that. We are like Jesus, who was always giving, always willing to be available. Amen? Amen. My Jesus, that lives on the inside of me and lives on the inside of you, is always willing to give to somebody else. To be available when perhaps in our self-life, or us, you know, we perhaps want to do something else. We want to be somewhere else. But my Jesus always wants to be in the right place at the right time, doing the right thing. Amen? And you have that Jesus on the inside of you. Praise God. Philippines 4 verse 19 says, And my God shall supply all your need, according to riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Luke 6, verse 38, I've quoted this one already. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Matthew 10, 8 says, Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 says, But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. I learned a lesson a long, long time ago, that if you have a need... Start to sow into that need into somebody else's life. God loves that. God honours that. And God will not be outgiven. Amen? Now that doesn't mean to say that you have to do it practically all the time. But it does mean to need, means that you need to do it in prayer. See, if you have a need or a want or a desire, start to pray for somebody else that has that need or want or desire in their life. A, it gets the focus off your need and puts it onto somebody else, which helps, amen? But it also means that you're sowing into somebody else's life, and as you do that, God will meet your need. 
Amen? It's a principle of the kingdom. Because we are now kingdom people and therefore need to operate in kingdom principles. <coughs> Excuse me. Amen? Hallelujah. Praise God. Okay. So, I shall not want. Amen? Can you turn to your neighbour and say, Hallelujah. My Jesus meets my need. Amen. Turn to them again and say, Therefore, I am not in want. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Do you believe it? Well, about 50% of you said yes. Do I believe it? Yes. Come on, that's it. Praise God. It's awesome. If you get hold of this, we begin to move and operate in a different dimension. Point three. He makes me lie down in green pastures. So where are your green pastures this morning? Just think about that for a minute. What are green pastures? What are green pastures? Where are your green pastures? Each and every one of us should know where the Lord's green pastures are. Let the shepherd lead you to your green pastures. Green pastures are a place of restoration. They're a place to feed from. They're the place, and this is most important of all, of his presence. <coughs> of peace and of rest. Many, many years ago, and some of you will have heard this story, that I used to work with horses. And at the end of the day, whatever they'd been doing, whether it had been riding school, eventing, show jumping, hunting, whatever, we would always, and the majority of them, turn them out into their green pasture. Why did we do that? Well, they needed to rest. They needed to relax. But above all, they needed to feed. They needed to feed on the grass and to recuperate so that the next day they could go out and do it all over again. And the process just went on and on and on. Amen? We need to be those that go into our green pastures and feed on the great shepherd of the, of our, of the flock. Amen? We need to spend time with him in the green pastures, feeding on him, resting, recuperating, hearing what he's got to say, so that we can go out and do it all over again. If we don't feed on him, if we don't get what we need from him, how can we give it to somebody else? Amen? How can we go and do it all over again if we don't feed on him? If we don't go into our green pastures and spend that quality time with him? Amen? And that doesn't mean spending hours and hours and hours there. If it does, that's great. But 10, 15, 20 minutes, half an hour of real quality time with Jesus will restore your soul. Amen? Will build you back up enough to be able to go out and do it all over again. <coughs> Meeting the needs of other people. Praying into their lives. Doing what it is that God asks you to do. You can only do that if you're going into your green pastures. So find out where your green pastures are. It's a quiet place where the presence of God is. Where you know when you go into that place, you're going to meet with God. You're going to encounter him. You're going to be able to spend time with him. So it's unlikely to be the kitchen. It's unlikely to be my office. Unless I take the phone off the hook, lock the door, pull the blind down, put a notice on the door, do not disturb. If I do that, then my office can become a green pasture. But if I don't do that, the phone's going to go. Somebody's going to come knocking on the door. It's hardly a place of peace and quiet and tranquility. 
It can be, but I have to make the effort to make it so. Sometimes we have to make the effort to make available a green pasture. We have to do something. We have to put something into place. We have to turn things off. Perhaps we have to turn the computer off. Perhaps we have to turn the television off or the radio just so that we can be quiet with Jesus. Because it's in the quietness and the stillness that God can speak into our hearts and into our lives. Amen? It's not in our busyness. It's not in the noise of what's going on. Although God can break through, because God's God. But the best place is in the quiet, still place. Amen? Hallelujah. John 10 verse 9 says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. Psalm 100 uh, 100 verse 3 says, Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and not we ourselves. Wow. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. So your green pasture is his pasture. It's where he is. Amen? Hallelujah. So know where your green pastures are. Point four. He leads me beside the still waters. Notice it says still waters. When I was studying this out, I noticed that what I learned was that the shepherd, if you want to do, if you want to understand our shepherd, the great shepherd of our flock, look up and read out what a shepherd does and how a shepherd looks after his sheep. It's quite amazing what they get into. But one of the things they do is they never lead, they always lead the sheep to where the water is still. They don't lead the the sheep to where there's a running river. Why? Because the sheep might get taken away by the running water. So they always lead the sheep to the still water where they can drink safely. God will always lead us to where it is safe to drink. Amen? Obviously the water... Today, that we need to drink is the living water of the Holy Spirit. So we need to come to to the Lord and ask him to fill us afresh with his Holy Spirit. Our bodies today are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Amen? So we have the Holy Spirit living in us, but we always have to come and drink more of the Spirit. John 7, 38 says, Out of our hearts will flow rivers of living water. The still waters represent peace, contentment and fulfilment and the Holy Spirit. Whereas the raging waters, the running waters if you like, represents tribulations, concern and worries and when we get into self a little bit as well. So we need to always be coming to the still waters, to the quiet waters and to receive a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit. There are several passages of scripture that come to mind. But the Lord reminded me of the story of the woman that goes to the well, where Jesus meets the Samaritan woman. And she has an encounter with Jesus. And that encounter, in turn, in verse uh, 13 and 14, says, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, but whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Amen? Are you drinking this morning from the supernatural well of Jesus rather than the natural wells of the world? We need to always be drinking in the water that Jesus gives us, the Holy Spirit and not the things of the world. Because the things of the world will pollute the Holy Spirit within us. 
So we always want to be looking to be drinking from the supernatural well of Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise God. Anyway, the, the, the amazing miracle of this story of the Samaritan woman was that she had an encounter with Jesus. She received the spiritual water from Jesus. And immediately she went back to her family, to her town, and said to them, and I spoke about this the other week, come and see who I have found. And they came and they had an encounter with Jesus. And as you all know the story very, very well, the whole town got saved. When we drink of the supernatural water of the Holy Spirit, something impacts our life. Something changes on the inside of us. That when we go and talk to other people, the life and power, and the anointing of God touches their life. And we can expect something, some miracle, something to happen in other people's lives because of what God has done in our lives. Amen? And it's just an amazing thing that God does. We become his witnesses when we have received the Holy Spirit. We become his ambassadors for Christ. And we take the life and the power that Jesus gives us and we release it wherever we go because we're taking his presence and it's his presence that makes a difference not only in our lives but wherever we take the presence of Jesus. And my Jesus goes with me wherever I go. Amen? The Jesus living on the inside of you goes wherever you go. So you are taking the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit wherever you are. And that power and that anointing can be released into the lives of everybody around you. You can go into a room where there is turmoil, confusion, where there is raging waters, and the presence of God can bring stillness and quietness and peace. Because you carry my Jesus on the inside of you. His presence is released wherever you go. Assuming, of course, that you are coming into the green pastures and feeding on him. Amen. Isaiah 55, verse 1 to 3 says, Ho, everyone who thirst, thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have no money, come buy and eat. Yes, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for what is not bread, and your wages for what does not satisfy? Listen carefully to me, and eat what is good, and let your soul delight itself in abundance. Incline your ear and come to me, hear, and your soul shall live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you. What an amazing Passage of scripture. Amen. Amen. Jesus, my Jesus, your Jesus, says, come to me and feed on me freely. It doesn't cost anything, he says, to come to him. It's free. It's available. Amen. Let's be those that don't spend money on what is not bread and are wages for what does not satisfy. But let's eat and feed on what is good. Amen? Because that is the blessing of God into our hearts and into our lives. Point five. He restores my soul. Hallelujah. Now, I felt I just needed to study this one a little bit. And I looked a couple of things up. And I'm just going to read uh, a short passage. In the Hebrew Bible, the term soul is nephesh, comes 756 times. The word can refer to life in Genesis 1.30, 
or simply the person. That's Deuteronomy 10.22. It also can designate the immaterial part of a human, equivalent to the spirit. Genesis 35.18 and James 2.26. The soul is the deepest part of us, our spirit and innermost being. Since God is the one who made us, only he can restore us. Because only he knows what we truly need to restore our souls. In other words, we cannot restore our own soul. Only Jesus can restore our soul because he's the only one that really knows what we need. Restores means returning to what has been lost. And we praise God for Jesus, don't we? And his sacrifice on the cross. Because our relationship that with, with God that was lost in the fall, right back in the beginning with Adam and Eve, God has restored our relationship with God through the shedding blood and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross for each and every one of us. And for those of us that believe, for those of us that have ask Jesus into their life. Jesus has now become my Jesus and your Jesus. Amen. Amen. Point six. And I'm about halfway. He leads me in paths of righteousness. What does that mean? What is God saying to us through that little passage? He leads me in the right way. John 14, verse 6. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen? In other words, he is our righteousness. We have no righteousness of ourselves. We have no ability to achieve true righteousness in and of ourselves, but we possess the righteousness of Christ. That's how we can be righteous. That's how we have our righteousness. Because we have no righteousness of ourselves, but Christ is our righteousness, and we have the Christ living on the inside of us. So we are able to be righteous. We have no ability to achieve true righteousness in and of ourselves, but we possess the righteousness of Christ because God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5.18 This is an amazing truth, that through the cleansing of sin by Jesus and on the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, we are the righteousness of God. Jesus exchanged our sin for his righteousness. So it's his righteousness that makes the difference, not us trying to do it. Because we can never get to the standard that Jesus wants us to. We will always fail to meet that standard of righteousness that God has set us in and of ourselves. But because we have the righteous one living in us, we can maintain and get that righteousness. Because it's not our righteousness, it's his righteousness that works in and through us. Do you get that? If you want to know more about this righteousness, read Romans. Romans is full of the righteousness of God. Hallelujah. It's an amazing truth of how we can walk in righteousness. And that's a challenge, especially when we're out there in the world, when there is so much unrighteousness. You know, we have to deal with that unrighteousness in our workplaces. But hey, we don't have to, because the Christ in us will help us. Because he is our righteousness. He is your righteousness. 
Because you have the righteous one living inside of you. Wow. For me, that's liberating. I don't have to get my own righteousness. I don't have to work it up. I don't have to try and do it because I've got the righteous one living inside of me. That's liberating. I'm not sure you look liberated yet this morning. I'm working on it. Hallelujah. Okay. I love this one. Point seven. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Comfort me. Amen. You know, you could look at this and say, oh dear, oh dear, walking through the valley of the shadow of death, goodness me. But look what he says, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. He's always with us as we go through the dark valleys, as we go through the difficult times. He is there. We're not on our own. We're not trying to get through it. We're not trying to deal with it on our own. God's there with us. God will take us through those valleys and bring us out on the other side. He will take us through the dark tunnels to the light at the end. Hallelujah. It's liberating, it's freedom, because he's there with us. We can put our trust on him and lean not on our own understandings. Acknowledge him in all our ways, and he who will direct our paths. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Whoa, I'm beginning to get preaching and excited up here. We need not fear. We don't have a spirit of fear, but a love, power, and of a sound mind. We don't need to worry, be concerned, because we have the Jesus on our side. And when God is for us, who can be against us? Amen? <coughs> Excuse me. He is our comforter and our protector. For his rod and his staff, they comfort us. They're not there to beat us over the head or make us do things. We have a free will. But the Jesus inside of us, my Jesus, will always say to your neighbour, always, 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 lead me in the right way. And he will always comfort me. <coughs> 2 Timothy 1.7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. When I was looking up this up and I was thinking about this and reading up one or two bits, I came across um, something about the sheep. Let me just read you what I've written down here. The sheep cannot protect themselves, they can only run. You know anything about sheep? Have any farmers in the house? Anybody that understands? Yes, got a few people around. Sheep will always run. They're not the easiest of animals. If you've had anything to do with sheep, they're, you know, they're particular, they're independent, they do their own thing, they go their own way, they run as soon as you get near them. But difficult. The sheep cannot protect themselves, they can only run. The shepherd is their protection. When the shepherd is around, the sheep are safe. Why? Because they trust the shepherd. They've learned that the shepherd looks after them and cares for them. When the shepherd is not around, they will be alert, looking for danger, and ready to run because that's their only defence. What were they frightened of? They were frightened of wolves or somebody, that, or dogs or whatever that might come in and attack them. Their only defence was to run. The shepherd keeps the flock together. If one wanders off, then he will go after the one. If you wander off, then you take yourself away from the protection within the flock and from the shepherd. Sheep always congregate together. Why? Because there's more protection when you're together. For the shepherd protects the flock. In other words, don't go off doing our own thing or being independent. Stay within the flock that God has placed us within. 
and stay with the shepherd. Maybe you've wandered off this morning. Maybe you're someone that thinks the grass is greener on the other side. But God is saying to you this morning that this is where he has placed you. This is your storehouse. This is your green pasture, as we were talking about earlier. This is the place he feeds you from. Luke 15, verses 4 to 7 say, says, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbours, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. If you've wandered off or you've managed to be drawn down a side road off God's plan or purposes, this morning the shepherd is coming after you. Hallelujah. He comes after us. If we go off doing our own thing or if we wander off or if we get lost because of you know, all sorts of things, the shepherd comes after us. Aren't you glad the shepherd comes after us? I'm glad my shepherd, my Jesus, comes after me when I go down an alleyway that I shouldn't go, or I go off on a tangent for whatever reason. And we're all able to do that, aren't we? Or am I the only one? Yeah? We're all able to get drawn off God's plan and purpose. But my Jesus comes after me, and he speaks to me, and he draws me back. Isn't Jesus wonderful this morning? So this morning, if you're gone off God's plan, if you've gone off or you feel you're going down a side road, Jesus, my Jesus, your Jesus is coming after you today. Hallelujah. And he's bringing you back. And he'll get you and set you on the right road. Amen. Amen. Isn't Jesus awesome? Wow. Point eight. How am I doing? You, are, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. The shepherd feeds the flock from his table. Whose table are you feeding from this morning? Whatever your need is, Take what you need today. And we're going to come to his table later. And we're going to feed on him. But daily we are to feed from his table. His table is where we need to receive what we need to for each and every day. So we need to come to his table daily. We need to come and feed on him. His table is where all the good things for you and I are. So don't be feeding off somebody else's table. Amen? Yeah. Hallelujah. You see, you know, we need to guard against feeding off the wrong table. We need to be only feeding off the table of Jesus. Point nine. You anoint my head with oil. You are anointed in the power and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Wow. Acts 1.8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Amen. Amen. You have received the power of the Holy Spirit. The power, the anointing, the ability to do all that God asks us to do. Jesus says, you have anointed my head with oil. Amen. And in Acts 1.8, you have received power 
when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Isaiah 61 says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because I, the Lord, has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison doors to those who are bound. Amen. You are anointed of God. You have the Spirit of God resting upon you. And point ten, my cup overflows. Are you overflowing this morning? Hallelujah. Is the Spirit of God flowing through your life this morning? Hallelujah. Have you received an infilling of the Holy Spirit this morning? Hallelujah. Praise God. Come on. Yes. Overflowing with the Holy Spirit, with his life, his power, his love, his grace, his wisdom. Is your cup running over? Have you received and drunk in so much that it's flowing out of you this today? Over onto the neighbour that you're sitting next to. Is the love flowing out of you like rivers of living water? Is it touching the people that you're sitting next to? Have you let the life of Jesus, have you let my Jesus out, your Jesus out today? Hallelujah. How many people have you blessed with the overflowing power and love and anointing of the Holy Spirit today? Is the joy of God filling your heart and overflowing? Because my Jesus is joy. Your Jesus is joy. Therefore, you have the joy of the Lord. Is the joy touching everybody around you today? Come on. You have my Jesus inside of you. And my Jesus is your Jesus. It's not just my Jesus. He's your Jesus. And if you have the Jesus living on, in, on the inside of you, you have everything that he has. Whoa, come on. It's awesome. He that is in you, stronger than he that's in the world. Amen. He is the mighty God that lives on the inside of you. You are a powerhouse on two legs. You have the ability to change the atmosphere, the circumstances of your life. Because the Jesus on the inside of you wants to explode and come out. Hallelujah. Praise God. Okay. The other thing that happens when the power, the anointing, the Jesus on the inside of you is being expressed, the enemy flees. He sees Jesus and runs. He's terrified of Jesus. Jesus defeated him on the cross, and he knows it. And he also knows where his destiny is. And we know where our destiny is, don't we? Amen? He sees you as a person destined, destined to do mighty deeds for God and has the power of Jesus on the inside of you. So when he sees you, he flees. He runs. He cannot stay where you are. He has to go. Amen. Just because you have the presence of God living on the inside of you. My Jesus does that. Wherever I go, the enemy has to flee. I don't care where it is or what he's doing. When I step into a room... If there's, a, if there's any activity of the enemy, it has to go. Yeah. Cannot stay in the presence of God. Wherever you take the presence of Jesus, the enemy has to flee. Yeah. You don't even have to tell him to flee. He sees Jesus and runs. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Come on, get excited. It's awesome. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. The enemy is defeated. Yeah. He is already beaten. He's already been sent packing. We just need by faith to believe it. Hallelujah. Come on. Whoa. The difference now is that we have the good shepherd living in us. So he is always with us. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 says, 
Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? Do you realise that you no longer belong to yourself? You gave that right up as soon as you invited Jesus into your life. You now belong to Jesus. He owns you. You belong to him. You died. And you were crucified with Christ and you were raised to new life. You became a totally new creation in Christ. And you received Jesus into your life. And he now rules and reigns with you in Christ. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Whoa. In Acts, when we read Acts, we see that when they were filled with the Holy Spirit, amazing things happened. We all know the stories. Thousands got saved. Thousands got healed. There were salvations. There were miracles. Why? Because the Holy Spirit filled the disciples and they went out and preached the gospel. John 15, 5 to 8 says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out as a branch and is withered. And they gather them and throw them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so that you will be my disciples. Amen. Basically what it's saying is we need to abide in him. And as we abide in him, he abides in us. Amen. Amen. And finally, I've put these two together, points 11 and 12. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen? Amen. Jesus will never leave you nor forsake you. Amen. Hebrews 13, 5 says, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content. Oh, we can only be content in Jesus. We will never be content in our own trying, our own works, but only in Jesus. Be content with such things as you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. <laughs> Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may attain mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. Grace is God's unmerited goodness and favour towards us. Lamentations 3.22-23 says, through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed, because he has compassion, for, sorry, because his compassion fails not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. God's mercy is God's unfailing love for you and me. Amen. Amen. We are recipients of God's love, of his grace and of his mercy. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Can we have you guys up? Praise God.